So, yes. <laughs> all right, I'm talking with uh, Stephanie Sanef, scientist from MIT, and she is now uh, in Boston, and she has her uh, her uh, her her interpretation of what SARS-CoV-2 is and whether it causes the disease called uh, COVID-19 or not, and whether we should uh, lock down everything to save ourselves or if this. So go ahead. Uh, I'll give you a free hand because this is a new subject to me. Go ahead. What What did you have to say? <laughs> okay, I have a lot to say, and I don't know quite where to start. But it's uh, I've been very intrigued by this disease because it's very um, affecting different countries very very differently. It's not even at all as far as which countries in the world are getting hit hard and which ones are hardly noticing it. It's very very interesting to look at those data. And, um, and even within a country like our country, to look at the individual cities that get hit hard and which ones don't, you start to see a pattern. And, uh, and I picked up on that early on when I first started looking at it. And I immediately suspected glyphosate because the countries that are being hit hard by COVID-19 are the ones that are using a lot of glyphosate. And um, <clears throat> particularly striking is all across America, North America, South America, Central America, all are being hit hard by COVID-19 and Western Europe, uh, those, those countries, and the rest of the world, not so much so. And within Africa, for example, South Africa is being hit much harder than other parts of Africa. And they're really the exceptional in terms of their use of glyphosate. Monsanto was in South Africa early. They have a lot of GMO maize that they grow, the corn crop, that's a staple of the diet. So I feel like um, the, uh, the evidence is really very striking, not only glyphosate, but also biofuels. And that's the subject that I knew very little about until I started looking and I started seeing which cities in the United States uh, seem to get hit hard. When COVID first arrives at their doorstep, uh, you've got New York City and um, Seattle and uh, New Orleans and Washington DC, Boston actually, uh, sort of the disease hits really hard when it first comes. Uh, lots of people get infected, hospitals get overwhelmed, ICU units get filled up. You know, this is happening um, very sudden, very uh, arrival of the virus that it spreads through the community very, very fast. So, like they can't really control it. And I suspect that that's because the individuals living in those areas have been, I'm suspecting they're being exposed to glyphosate through the air. They're breathing glyphosate from the fumes, from the biofuels. And the biofuel industry is a real sleeper because I really wasn't aware of it particularly until I started looking. And it's quite, quite interesting because when you look at the sources of, um, few of the, 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 the biological sources that make these biofuels, they're all gonna be loaded with glyphosate. For example, the wheat crop is sprayed right before harvest uh, as you know, as a desiccant, the harvest is done. They take, you know, they take, they, they do the harvest, and then the residue that's left over, the stalks and whatnot, they pile them onto a barge, ship them down to New York City, and <clears throat> run them through a bioengineering plant that turns them into biofuel. So um, you have the residues of the crops, so the corn crop, the G GMO corn, sugar cane, all, all these crops that are going to be contaminated with glyphosate are so uh, turned into mostly... fuel. Biofuel, is it made mostly from corn or mostly from some other crop? All kinds of crops. In fact, canola, there's, canola is uh, sometimes produced just as biofuel with no other product. I see. Um, it's a big crop for biofuel, especially, for example, in China, right around Wuhan. My husband actually visited that area some time ago, and they very proudly showed him these vast fields of canola that were being used to make biofuel uh, in Wuhan. And so... Um, the, it's, it's really, uh, New York City is a major leader in the biofuel industry in our country. They actually require 5%, uh, at least 5% in home heating oil, of biofuel, bio home heating oil. And there's biofuel in the airplanes, there's aviation biofuel. And then there's, of course, ethanol. The United States is a leader with the ethanol. We have pretty much 10% ethanol in our gasoline. That's coming from the GMO Roundup Ready corn. Brazil also produces ethanol, a lot of it, and they produce it from sugarcane, but sugarcane is commonly sprayed right before harvest. So when you look at all these crops, for example, Europe uh, imports a lot of biodiesel from Argentina, and Argentina produces that biodiesel from soybeans, GMO Roundup Ready soybeans. So all of these biofuels are coming from things that are contaminated with glyphosate, particularly where they're coming from the crops. There's also, well, also from the food, for example, food oils. A lot of countries are interested in, in different parts of the United States taking 
the waste fuel oil from restaurants and turning that into biofuel. And that's going to be these veg vegetable oils, canola oil, soybean oil, uh, especially corn oil, uh, the um, cotton seed oil from the cotton. That's not even necessarily food grade. So they can use lots of glyphosate on the cotton, even more than you could use on food grade crops. So all those oils are going to have probably going to have glyphosate in them as well. And then they do this anaerobic digester, which is quite interesting to make a biogas. And that's going on, for example, in New York City. They actually uh, sell gas to the community um, that's produced by this vast plant that's in the middle of New York City, right between Queens and um, uh, Brooklyn. Queens and Brooklyn were the epicenter of the epicenter in New York City when the, when the virus first hit here. And they have this massive uh, plant that processes the sewer, the, all the sewer that comes out of New York City, combined with various other things that are like, I mean, I don't know what, but garbage, basically, you know, they sort of combine, they're becoming more and more sophisticated, kind of throwing the kitchen sink, sink in there and turning the crank and producing fuel. And those fuels have been shown to be toxic. Studies that have compared biodiesel to regular diesel have shown that biodiesel is worse in all respects, considerably more carbon monoxide, sulfur um, oxides and nitrogen oxides and cyanide, all these things. Um, higher level, and of course the nanoparticles. I mean, that's the big thing, the nanoparticles. And another thing that's interesting about the biofuels and the air pollution is that it's been identified. And there was a study out of Harvard that showed a strong correlation between nanoparticles and air pollution. At the county level, they looked across the entire United States at um, air pollution and its correlation with uh, rate of death from COVID-19, and they found a correlation and um, Europe, as I think I've found three different papers from Europe, various parts of Europe that say the same thing. Uh, but uh, air pollution is linked to bad outcome. And you can imagine, you know, air pollution is going to hurt your lungs. And that's going to make your lungs more sensitive to the virus. But the fact is that that air pollution correlation doesn't hold across the world. Because I did a plot where I got air pollution data, nanoparticle data for various countries around the world and plotted it against COVID-19 death rates. And there's absolutely, if anything, the correlation is inverse. The countries that have very high air pollution have very low deaths from COVID-19. And the ones that cluster with a high death rate from COVID-19 are all relatively low on air pollution compared to those other countries. But they all are characteristically Europe and South America, places where they're using a lot of glyphosate in, and that they have the biofuel industry. So I think it's the combination of the glyphosate and the biofuel that's making the air pollution um, a, a, a susceptibility factor for COVID-19. So you, you are saying it's compromised lung because of pollution and compromised immune system because of glyphosate? That yes. Is making right. the person vulnerable to variants of flu or other infections. Yeah, all infections, I think. In fact, I, uh, the other thing I've been looking at is this vaping. Uh, you know, cigarette, e-cigarettes, vaping, uh, smoking these uh, glycerol, actually, these e-cigarettes are loaded up with glycerol. That's the base that they dissolve the nicotine in. That's the solvent. And glycerol is, a, uh, is the primary uh, byproduct of the biofuel industry. So uh, they, glycerol is a glut on the market right now because biofuels are really heating up. We're doing a lot more effort with biofuels. It's because of, you know, climate change, issues of not trying to trying to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels. The idea is to replace them. Everyone thinks that's a good idea, but I really am concerned about it with respect to the fact that the food is toxic. And um, the e-cigarettes e have glycerol. And the, I had been aware of this strange lung disease that was showing up among smokers of e-cigarettes even before COVID-19 hit. I was looking into that because I was suspecting glyphosate there because if the glycerol contains glyphosate, which I suspect it does, then when you are um, smoking the cigarette, you're actually breathing glyphosate into the lungs. And then the glyphosate is what's creating the um, immune deficiency in the lungs, which then prevents your immune cells from being able to clear the virus when you breathe it in. And the virus just takes off and goes on fire and you produce lots of uh, products from it. Your, your cells are, are, are very fertile environment for the virus to reproduce itself. And then, so anyone who's in that environment is coughing up lots more viral particles than people in a safer place. So that's why the infection spreads like wildfire and you get this huge hit uh, because of the susceptibility of all the people in that population uh, because of their exposure to glyphosate from the air. That's what I'm claiming. That's the hypothesis that I have. Hmm. 
So, okay, I, I get that part of it, that if you are subjected to a polluting atmosphere uh, environment uh, to live in, uh, to, to be exposed to pollutants, uh, yes, you're likely to get sick. And if you are having compromised immune system, you're unlikely to fight these uh, off as easily as you would have if you were healthy. These two I can understand. But if it is COVID-19 or just all kinds of other things, this is where <clears throat> I personally am suffering from a bout of disbelief. Uh, firstly, because in the area where I live near about Vancouver, and I've been here 20 years odd. So I may be knowing 2000 odd people personally in my neighborhood and friends and not one of them or their parents or children, anybody has ever been even sick, let alone going to hospital, let alone dying. So it is mm -hmm. a bit hard for me to understand that people are dropping off like flies and we have to lock ourselves because common sense or just keeping our eyes open doesn't seem to show that. But there is an effort to shut down industries, shut down businesses. This I can see. I can see that people are going bankrupt. This I can see. So this is one thing. And the other thing is, at least in Canada, at least in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, more and more stringent laws are coming in. You cannot uh, have a party in, in Halloween. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. You cannot uh, congregate. You cannot assemble. You cannot uh, visit relatives even. I mean, this is ridiculous. Even, even in in Halloween time, which Canada uh, um, celebrates a month ahead of USA because it gets very cold that time. So so that's a time when uh, people have parties and relatives visit each other. So they passed a resolution, uh, by law or whatever, some kind of a dic dictat that uh, relatives are not now um, allowed to visit their folk, you know. So yes. this kind of thing is all ap appears to me to be based on reports of infection in tests rather than sickness. So that right. is, a guy is walking around perfectly all right like me and he got mm. tested and it turned out that. So my first question is whether that test is worth the paper on which it is printed <laughs> or it is all both. This is the first thing. And second thing, if a man is not sick, if a woman is not sick, what the hell is the value of that test? You know, earlier, you have a guy who is sick, first of all, and then you find out why he is sick. You test him and say, okay, you got pneumonia, you got tuberculosis, you got this or that, cancer. But here, a person is healthy, and then you're saying he's sick. So I'm told, again, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm not a, a cellular biologist, I'm not a geneticist. <clears throat> I'm told that the test involves tracking of some segments of DNA uh, which is supposed to prove that a particular virus is in you. I'm not even sure if that is correct or not. So if that is correct, then my question would have been, is there any proof that what you're testing is only there in that virus and not in anything else? Who has that proof? I'm told there's no such proof. And you told me once that the test is employs fuzzy logic. That means if some of the parts are found, others are not found, the chances are high that you go. So who proves It's also, that? so I think it's based on thresholds too, so you can arbitrarily set the threshold low or high and decide um, their fate based on where you set the threshold. You can make it very sensitive or you can make it less sensitive. Yeah, so I understand, it, I understand. They, so, they take uh, a tiny bit and then they blow it up with these tech, tech technology uh, that they use. I, I understand that. Now, uh, uh, Anthony Samsel had said that uh, had 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 uh, had indicated in an email that uh, coronavirus or, or SARS-CoV-2 has definitely been isolated, identified, and genetically code, coded, uh, and uh, and uh, and it is known as distinct from everything else. I would like to know who did that and where is that paper because I I don't seem mm. uh, there seems to be enormous amount of confusion on the very first issue: Are we testing something real or not, and why? Well, if it is real, then why it is healthy people are being carted off that, oh, our numbers are increasing, everybody must shut down. Oh, what's <laughs> the point? The guy who is completely healthy, uh, he doesn't show any symptoms. That means that the whatever is there is not doing any harm. What do you have to say to this? <laughs> yeah, well, so I have my own opinions about things. And I agree with you that I think they're making a dracon draconian efforts that are way overkill for what it, the situation demands. 
And I also think that many, I suspect that many of the people who are dying were on death's bed. They were on death's bed. Oh yeah, there is an issue of comorbidity and old people but, yeah, and so on. Yeah, they were people who were very sick. They were sort of uh, at, you know, yeah, they were so just supposed about to, to die. die anyway. And probably yeah. maybe even their relatives were relieved, I suspect, in some cases, because they were just waiting yeah, for them true, to die, true, you know, true. I suspect. I mean, there is a, a lot of there is a uh, statistics going around. I'm not sure that it's absolutely correct, but it's probably correct. Uh, and that says that the average age in Canada of COVID death is 84 years old. That's amazing. And average death of Canadians in general is 83 years old. In other words, you get COVID, you get to live one year extra. No? So, <laughs> That's good. That's so, very good. They're all people that, that, who are passing This kind of crazy things are going around. And the other thing I'm told is... Uh, the other kind of test, I don't even know the names, but other kind of test doesn't check for presence of genetic, I mean, DNA uh, sequence, but it checks for antibodies, yes. which would be generated if, for instance, you were infected by coronavirus. Again, I'm told, and you can tell me whether that's correct or not, there is no proof that this antibody comes only because of COVID, and most people say, no, it's a general antibody that is, uh, that is produced whenever you're infected with anything. It can be, it can be A, B, C, D, E, F, Z, A, 9, all kinds of things. And you have that antibody that doesn't mean anything. That could be that you're, right. in, you're already immune to it or you got something else for that. You're pre it doesn't necessarily say you're sick with COVID. So this is another reason. And when I try to get Canadian politicians to answer, they sidestep it. They, they, they don't want to touch this subject. So that is more frustrating, you know? I know, I know. I mean, it's really interesting that we're willing to basically destroy the economy for the sake of this virus that most people are not experiencing any contact with. Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, heard uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. recently? I, I love him. He's been really speaking out. I'm, I'm very, um, I think he's yeah, fantastic. He, he said something that I wanted to cross check by writing to the Prime Minister of Canada, and he doesn't seem to answer, but I'm after it. Uh, it seems that Canada has ordered for 37 million shots of vaccines uh, against COVID-19, and that uh, that the price of the vaccines are 400 Canadian dollars. So my question to them was, where is this money coming from? As far I as I understand, <laughs> government has no money. And it has to come from the people. And why is it not the most massive shift of wealth from the poor to the rich without giving the poor any even chance to consider whether they want it or not? Because I if know. you don't want it, you go to jail, you cannot travel, you cannot live a normal life. You are essentially forcing them to take it at this price. And I'm told that poor countries will also be taking it, but maybe at $1 a shot. So, the, so, so, so they, they don't go bankrupt trying to... So if... I mean, there is too much of uh, muddy waters in this whole thing. So uh, we are confused on what should be our social duty uh, to deal with this. And you had another idea. You had, you, you had said that maybe the SARS-CoV-2 doesn't cause the disease, but it is a response to the disease or something like that. Right. I'm actually really interested in that. And I've had uh, the suspicion for a long time that um, the that the so-called pathogens, which are sort of the nasty vi viruses, bacteria that cause disease, they're not in there trying to kill you. They're actually trying to help you out. And you get sick because of the toxic chemical exposures and because of the nutritional deficiencies. And then there's all kinds of different microbes and different kinds of li life forms, small life forms that are equipped to do something about the situation and that sort of come in and try to help you out to solve your problems. I think that's what's going on. And I, I'm particularly fascinated with uh, COVID-19 and the disease process, and particularly in light of my recent discoveries related to deuterium. And it's just so, so fascinating, it's somewhat complicated science, but I can probably simplify it quite a bit. It's really, really interesting. Um, it has to do with mitochondrial dysfunction. I mean, you know that mitochondrial disorder is a base uh, feature in many, many different diseases, especially autoimmune diseases, uh, even in cancer, you know, in, in, in Alzheimer's, all these different autism, they all have a mitochondrial dysfunction component to them. And I think it's basic. I think the mitochondria get sick because they get overloaded with deuterium and they yeah, get overloaded, overloaded with deuterium. Yeah, so deuterium is heavy hydrogen. 
Yeah. And it's a natural component of the environment. It's present. Yes. Very water. small quantity. 150, well, that's not small. It sounds small, 155 parts per million. That's, I think it's six times as much deuterium in the blood as there is calcium. And calcium is a high level of calcium in the blood, right? Calcium. So these numbers are not small. People think things like part per million are small, and that's not true. But they're you know? stable. They don't go away. I, that's why deuterium oxide was called uh, heavy water in, uh, yes. in nuclear reactors. Absolutely right. Yes, that's sort of where we first got interested. And actually, it's really fun to look back at the early literature because they were very keen to make heavy water back when they were trying to do atom bombs and things like that. And back in the 60s, there were several papers that were really fascinating where they exposed animals. There's an absolutely ast ast astonishing paper from, I think, I Is don't know. Is it 155 19... parts per million? That's quite, uh, quite frequent. It's not so rare. It's not so rare when you consider how many hydrogen atoms they are. That's the thing, relative to hydrogen. But hydrogen is like 99% of the atoms in our body are hydrogen. So it's in, in entire space, amount. entire galaxy, entire universe, the hydrogen is the most prominent. Uh, it's, it's huge. Yeah, there's huge uh, amounts of it. So, and of course, hydrogen is super, super important. That's where, that's really the key for all these reactions where you make different molecules, you know, nutrients and whatnot. So all you the, mean deuterium has some effect in the health of the mitochondria in the cells? It has a huge effect. So when you look at these experiments they did back in 1960, really fascinating article I read about rats. They exposed these rats to, they, they did like, you know, very high, like 75% deuterium, D2O, deuterium heavy water in a, in a, a sugar solution. They fed these rats this, this stuff, you know? And, and the rats got very, very uh, ferociously hungry and ferocious. They started beating each other up. They became very, very belligerent and angry and they were just fighting. And when then, they were given deuterium oxide as water to uh, drink? All they were, uh, the only difference was deuterium oxide and it wasn't like all the water they were getting, they just got some. But it was very high levels, much higher than you'd ever expect in nature. But the thing is, you know, you really, you, you can't even taste it. It's really quite amazing that something could be so poisonous. And these, these rats, they got re really violent. And then within a few days, they got completely, um, Com they just basically collapsed and died, you know, and, and the really uh, the ones that were still energetic enough would beat up on the ones that were so uh, exhausted they couldn't do anything. And then they all died within nine days. They were all dead. I mean, that's how bad it was. Drinking really, deuterium really oxide. Hard. I'm told that chemically deuterium oxide is just like water. It will react with things the same way as normal water would. That's not correct, is it? That is not correct. Deuterium is a, it, because it's twice as heavy, it has very different properties from hydrogen. And it binds more t tightly in covalent bonds. It binds more tightly, and it um, so it really it, it gets released into the gas uh, phase much less. So if you make hydrogen, you know, like if you drink hydrogen water, that hydrogen gas that you're drinking is low deuterium because it sticks in the it sticks in the water part, doesn't go into the gas. And also, the really important thing is it's really bad at something called quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is a, a physical effect, a physical phenomenon that protons are capable of doing and deuterons pretty much are not. They're too heavy. They won't do it. And so the body takes advantage of quantum tunneling. And there are all these enzymes that have been especially designed to be able to promote quantum tunneling in the reaction. They're pulling hydrogen off of one molecule and sticking it onto another. And in doing so, they refuse to accept deuterium. They will only put hydrogen. So what happens is you make something like fats. When you make um, fatty acids, the enzymes that are involved in doing that know how to make sure that the deuterium content in the fatty acid is low. And then that fatty acid becomes a really good nutrient. So if you eat a high fat diet, you're eating a low deuterium diet. And that is useful for the mitochondria because the mitochondria hate deuterium. Deuterium gums up the ATPase pump that makes the ATP. It gets messed up by deuterium. And what happens is that the uh, mitochondria release more of these reactive oxygen species and they can't make as much ATP, so they get sick when they get too much deuterium. And the reason why they're getting too much deuterium, in my opinion, is glyphosate. Very, very uh, uh, why? why? Why is that or how is that? Yeah, so the, it, there's a lot of reasons, but the most uh, interesting one is, is a class of proteins called flavoproteins. There's about 80 of them in the body, flavoproteins, and many of them are involved in pulling a hydrogen off and sticking it on something else. And the flavoproteins, they bind to something called flavin. And at the flavin binding site, they have a, a particular motif that's a GXX, GXXG motif that has three glycine residues highly conserved at the place where they bind phosphate. 
and this is the same. This is this is in the mitochondria or in the protein construct? All all over the place. These enzymes operate in many different places, but many of them are in the mitochondria, and many of them are involved with making sure the mito uh, mitochondria have deuterium depleted water, and all of them are going to be affected by glyphosate. In fact, I've got a big list of proteins that are known to be affected by glyphosate in papers they found in studies that it suppresses these specific proteins that are fla flavoproteins. So the pattern fits, but also it fits the EPSP synthase because the way I think glyphosate is disrupting the enzyme in the shikimate pathway that it famously disrupts is through messing up phosphate binding. This is for the general uh, body, but is the mitochondria engaged in uh, producing proteins or uh, or uh, this process that you said, I, I had heard that the body gets affected, but I didn't hear that exactly function of the mitochondria. It is a very important function that I They understand. make ATP. They make ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. They provide mm -hmm. energy to the cell. And is the, uh, is the effect of glyphosate or deuterium uh, affecting the mitochondria's uh, ability to um, energize the cell? Mm -hmm. It's it exactly what it's doing. Yeah. And so the cell actually switches over to glycolysis. So it makes lots and lots of lactic acid uh, instead of processing through the mitochondria to make a, a ATP through uh, what's called the citric acid cycle. It, it, the citric acid cycle is not working well anymore because of um, this impairment with all this uh, deuterium problem. The mitochondria uh, gets sick and the cell has to use this anaerobic um, method to make a small amount of ATP by breaking, by turning glucose into uh, lactic acid. Mm -hmm. So you get lactic acidosis and actually you get lactic acidosis in severe cases of COVID-19, which is interesting. You, you have a paper that more or less covers these things? I don't yet. I mean, I have some articles that I've written on the web. I actually have maybe three or four now for various magazines, but I haven't, I don't have a published peer review. Can you uh, send paper. me the link to those three or four, some of the things that you're saying, which if the Listener can't get their, uh, uh, can't gra grasp those uh, molecules or terms because they are not uh, normal English terms. So I can grab it from your article and put it there that this is what you're talking about. Yeah, and you could actually put links to my articles there, which would be good. I have some that are uh, glyphosate and COVID-19, the and then a couple that are glyphosate and deuterium. I've just started to start writing articles. I've only recently figured this out. What's so amazing to me is what the virus does, because when the virus comes into the lungs... You're talking about SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, and okay. probably other viruses as well, but certainly that's the one I've been looking at, because there's all these papers that are coming out. It's wonderful. They, people are really trying hard to figure out what's going on, and, and what they're seeing is phenomenal, because that virus... I believe what it's doing is it's trying to help the, so the immune cells are broken because their mitochondria are busted. They can't clear the virus. And the virus actually orchestrates a program in the body geared towards uh, solving the mitochondrial problem in the macrophages. So it's gonna solve the immune cell deficiency so that the immune cell can kill it. So the virus is trying to help out the immune cells, or at least the virus collaborating with the human host cells is working on a program with the hope that it will fix the mitochondria in the in the immune cells so that the immune cells can kill off the virus. Does that make sense? I mean, I haven't told how, but that's the concept. Now, how many cells are immune cells? All cells have immune uh, protective mechanism, or there are some cells that are free floating and going from here to there and, and kind of uh, dealing with uh, uh, intrusive pathogens. Uh, how is it? I, I, I'm not sure. Immune yeah, yeah. cells. Well, are the white, white blood cells. The white <coughs> blood cells are actually pretty much the. Immune okay, that's in the bloodstream, cells. and and, el, 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 and they're mobile. Sweating. They go everywhere, and they actually go into the side. So when when the virus comes in, and if the and if the immune cells can't clear it, it goes into the, it affects the the lung uh, epithelium. Actually, it affects the cells in the lungs, and those cells spit out more viruses because because they they know how to multiply inside the cells and get infected. Mm. So they make a bunch more, and then those are all released. <laughs> You've got a phone call. <laughs> go on, go on. Yeah, and so, <laughs> and um, and then what's fascinating is the actual response that happens when the virus can't be cleared. Because when the when the body sees there's all these viruses and they're out of control and it needs to do something desperate, it actually implements a program that starts with this inflammation, this inflammatory response, which releases the signaling molecules that cause that orchestrate this response that is. Um, that is really fascinating because it's it's basically filling up the lungs with water, uh, telling the lungs to make a lot of a of a molecule called hyaluronic acid. Huge amounts of hyaluronic acid are made, 
that actually, it's like a sponge. It soaks up water and it turns water into gel. So it makes a hydrogel. And that hydrogel starts filling up the alveoli in the lungs. So the lungs are basically, you feel like you're drowning. The person who gets, who gets this serious response feels like they're drowning. Their lungs are filling up with water. And that water is becoming gelled water inside the alveoli. So they aren't able to get oxygen because the water is in the way. It's, make, it's creating a systemic hypoxia problem, low oxygen supply to the body, which in turn creates a whole other you know, systematic response to the low oxygen. But the, um, but the virus actually has a, a membrane. It makes a membrane from the, from the host cell. The host cell has these membranes that are loaded up with fats and cholesterol and whatnot. And when the virus punches through the, the membrane of the host cell, it puts a, a, a lipid envelope, a fatty envelope around the virus particle of the human um, fatty acids from the human cell. And those fatty acids can get metabolized. They can get converted into um, things called leukotrienes by an enzyme called lipoxygenase. And lipoxygenase gets turned on. Uh, and that is how it is supposed to neutralize the virus? Or that is when well, virus... no, that's how it makes deuterium depleted water. That's what's so fascinating. The lipoxygenase is an extremely good, it's very clever at being able to, to choose hydrogen over deuterium and it makes water out of oxygen. So the whole thing is to make water out of oxygen in such a way that you don't choose deuterium. So, you know, water is H2O and you don't want HDO or, D, or D2O, you want H2O. And this lipoxygenase is an incredible enzyme. It's, I have not found any I mean, other Are you enzyme. saying that somehow the deuterium <clears throat> atom can be split to make two hydrogen atoms? No, 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 but just that when it chooses, so you have um, these, all these molecules and they have hydrogens on them. And every once in a while there's a deuterium, right? It's just here and there, there's a deuterium. And uh, there are these flavoproteins are very skilled at saying, oh, you've got deuterium, I won't use you. I, I reject, I won't, I won't take you as my source because you've got deuterium. So we'll only choose the ones that don't have deuterium. And this lipoxygenase is extremely good at doing that. And it steals hydrogen from the fatty acids. It steals hydrogen from the fatty acids and turns it into water by combining it with oxygen. And it needs this inflammatory response to do that because that's what triggers this uh, enzyme to work. And what's happening is that the hyaluronic acid is trapping deuterium heavy water. Water that has a lot of deuterium in it is getting trapped in that gel, in that hydrogel. And the fluid water that's left behind, which is in the interstitial spaces between the, uh, the ca capillaries and the alveoli. The alveoli are these little circles in the lungs that are filled with air. They're getting filled up with hydrogel, which is this gelled water. And then outside there, between that and the capillary is the space that's becoming uh, filled up with deuterium depleted fluid water. The viruses are making that happen. The deuterium depleted fluid water is sweet nectar for the, for the immune cells. They all come swarming in there. And what you see is a huge attraction of the immune cells to that space where there's all these viruses in the infection in the lungs. The immune cells come in there, they drink that water and they fix their mitochondria. There's a process called macropinocytosis. It's kind of a fun word, big, drink, big drinking basically. And these things can sweep up that deuterium depleted water, take it in and feed it to their mitochondria to make them well. Mm. It's really mm. fascinating. And even other cells, like there's these uh, stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells that come out of the bone marrow, they come in there too. And also the platelets escape from the blood and they go in there too. So all, they're having a big party in that space where there's that beautiful water that's been created through the collaboration between the lipoxygenase and the hyaluronic acid. They have collaborated to produce this beautiful water, which all the cells want to give to the, um, to the immune cells to fix them. So the entire body, you know, the, the platelets and the uh, bone marrow cells and the macrophages are all working very hard to, um, to, to provide this deuterium depleted water to the macrophages so that they can fix their mitochondria. And once they fix them, then they can eat the viruses and clear them. Mm. So that's a concerted effort on the part of the body to clear the virus by first creating this special water that the immune cells need to get fixed. But, uh, okay. But how do you kill a virus since a virus is 
by definition, not exactly living. Well, maybe you're not really killing it because it's not really alive is what you're saying, right? <laughs> it's a question of whether it really is alive. But well, what I mean by killing it is basically taking it up into the lysosome. You, you're neutralizing such a way that it cannot infect another cell and well, cannot break it reproduce down. itself. I mean, actually take it into the lysosome and digest it using the digestive enzymes in the, in the cell. The cell is able to break it down and use it, actually use its contents as a resources, as nutritional resources for I the see, it's basically food. I think of these viruses as little food pellets. But the problem is the macrophages, the, you know, the immune cells aren't able to eat them because they're so sick. Mm. And once you fix the immune cells, they can eat the food pellets and the food pellets will go away and the person will be, will be healed. And I suspect they'll be healed if they do recover. Their immune system is now stronger than it used to be because their macrophages have been provided with this uh, repair mechanism that's going to help them have healthy mitochondria until such time as they continue to eat poison and wreck them again. But, you know, but, you know, it's all these comorbidities that, that they see, the, the diabetes, the obesity, the high blood pressure, you know, these things are all going up in our society exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. I mm -hmm. think glyphosate is causing that. that. So mm -hmm. when you see that this I can understand. has those then comorbidities, which are risk factors for dying, they're indicators that they're being poisoned by glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Tell me something. This has often puzzled me in my questioning mind. I don't know if you can answer it. Is some somebody who uh, understands uh, evolution, uh, the 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 first evolution, uh, primal, uh, four billion years ago. Since viruses are technically not living and they need living cells in order to exist and and propagate, mm -hmm. so is it safe to assume that the first trace of life came on single cell bacterium and so on and viruses are kind of a byproduct of that or it, that yeah, there were these small segments of dna which were not living all over the place and somehow uh, <laughs> some coalition took place and and, and a self propagating uh, which one came with chicken and egg i mean what do you i think? know that's a good question i suspect the viruses are um are secondary i imagine it was sort of a one-celled animal was the first kind of like living and somehow these are debris spread. that came out from all yeah, the I, I think of them as being very similar to these exosomes and that's one thing that you know uh tom uh cowan talks about do you know tom cowan i know i know andrew dr. Tom, dr. who tom talks cowan. about uh, andrew kaufman talks about uh, exosomes a lot yeah okay it's a similar thing they're both are talking the same story i think uh, quite fast and they think that uh, sars cov 2 is nothing more than exosomes uh, yes. they look similar and, and they have they this do. Now well, there, we have this standardized uh, shape of a tennis ball with a lot of antennas coming out everywhere, and that is SARS-CoV-2, you know? So, so well, exosomes it's fascinating like that. fascinating to me that the exosomes and the viruses are so similar, and it's really, it's really hard to tell them apart. They're the same size. They, they both have RNA in, often inside them and um, various proteins, and then they have a lipid coat. I mean, it's really remarkably sim similar, and it's probably the case that Possibly the case. So the this, this SARS-CoV-2 is, is it also essentially one molecule of protein and one molecule of uh, fatty acid wrapped around each other, or no? No, no, it's not that simple. It has, of course, the RNA sequence, and and you know I think it must be fairly well specified. I know a lot of people are saying we don't really quite know exactly what, but you know people oh. have taken the RNA sequence uh, supposedly of this virus and they've run it through analysis. This is actually a fascinating paper that starting with that RNA sequence and then predicting the, uh, the effects that that would have uh, metabolically and predicting the, uh, the outcomes with these uh, COVID-19 patients. This really so-called RNA sequence, we know about the double, double helix of the DNA. So if you pry the two helix apart, are they, are each one of them could be called an RNA or it is a different structure? Well, the RNA is derived from the DNA, and the difference is very subtle. The DNA is, is deoxyribonucleic yes, acid, yes. and RNA is ribonucleic acid. Correct. Acid. Without the it doesn't have the deoxy part. It's but a very as far as the shape is concerned, RNA, is, I know it's very small, but is it? Well, RNA, so the, interesting to me, and I don't quite understand the significance of that, but I'm suspecting some things. The RNA that's in these viruses is a single strand RNA, whereas the DNA is a double strand. And that makes a huge difference in how it's structured. And in fact, so I suspect- So you mean the, not the viral RNA, but otherwise what we understand by RNA is also supposed to be double-stranded? Single-stranded. Well, I'm not sure all of it's single-stranded, but I know the RNA viruses have a single strand of RNA, not a double strand. It's mm -hmm. only a single strand. So it's only half of the, of the 
sequence. You know, the other half is not there. It's quite fascinating. And also it's very different biophysically because it's opened up like that. When you have it double strand, they're all hooked together. And so there's sort of more security in that. There's less that it can do. I believe so that- So it needs that, to infect a cell to make the other half to, make, uh, to turn into something the, that can duplicate it itself or, or what? It, it relies know. on the cell's machinery to help it do that. I mean, it really draws on, it orchestrates uh, the cell. It, it takes over the cell really and, and of course. tells it what to do. And what it tells it to do is make more of me. And the cell knows how to do that very well. It's quite fascinating to me that it has the information in it. And different viruses have different uh, ways. They have proteins in them. They have RNA that codes for proteins and those proteins are in the virus and those proteins are what allows the virus to uh, to get in because they have specific proteins that are, are taken up, up by specific receptors. So in the case of, the, of this virus, it's actually quite unusual that it's the ACE2 receptor uh, that it binds to to get inside the cell. And that's another thing that's interesting because if uh, it, it causes, this, this study that I mentioned that looked at the RNA and figured out what would happen and they found that um, ACE2 receptor would be um, massively upregulated. So you have lots of ACE2 receptors in response to the virus, which allows the virus to very quickly replicate itself. And, um, and then that's what causes uh, overexpression, also something called brat bradykinin. And the bradykinin is what opens up the blood vessels and allows those macrophages to gain entry and fills up the blood with water and, and fills up the lungs with water and causes that whole cascade. That's all orchestrated in response to the virus through this ACE, uh, messing up the ACE uh, receptor uh, activities. It's, it's, it's really fascinating how the virus sort of causes the lungs to, to, to completely switch their policy. Instead of bringing in oxygen, they bring in water and they make hyaluronic acid. And, they, and the virus itself actually traps deuterium as well. I think that open RNA is helping the virus to trap deuterium. So you're pulling the deuterium out of the main water, leaving behind fluid water that's low in deuterium. Oh, that's not easy. It's separating deuterium from uh, pure water itself. It, you need an industrial sized plant. I, I'm no, told. no, you just have to have something like hyaluronic acid or uh, heparin sulfate. There's all these molecules that make gel. Oh, you water. can chemically separate them instead of. Well, uh, you make the gelled water, and the, and the deuterium wants to stay in the gel, whereas the protons are let loose. So, Gerald Pollack has talked a lot about how this structured water becomes uh, negatively charged and pushes out protons. Those protons that it pushes out are very healthy protons with very few deuterons because the deuteron forms stronger bonds to what's in the gel. And it's a lot heavier, so it's less likely to leave. It's, it's more stable within the gel. And so that's a really great way of-, of uh, Well, oxygen is, uh, oxygen is 16 and hydrogen is one, deuterium is two. So, uh, so H2O would be, uh, 18 or 19. The difference between 18 and 19 is not too great. Well, no, it's a little bit. Yeah, I know. You're right. The deuterium is twice as heavy as the hydrogen, and the hydrogen is a lot lighter than the oxygen. Yeah. But, the, but the heaviness of the deuterium makes it have a stronger covalent bond. I think it's like five times as strong as the hydrogen bond. And okay. because it's heavy, it doesn't want to move as easily. Oh, I see. Hydrogen uh, doesn't, um, just the structure that's formed in the structured water has a hole so that one hydrogen needs to leave. And it's just more, much more likely that's going to be a hydrogen rather than a deuterium. So you end up pushing the hydrogens out, creating deuterium depleted water in the fluid while you're trapping deuterium in the gel. And, you, and one of the problems with glyphosate is that it disrupts the gel, the formation of gel. I think that's a huge, I, I learned that very early about glyphosate because of its disruption of sulfate. And normally the blood has the glycocalyx, which is gelled water hydrogel lining the blood vessels created by the sulfates that are populating the glycocalyx. Glyphosate disrupts the production of those and the transport of those sulfates. So when you have the sulfate deficiency, you have a very thin hydrogel layer in the, in the blood vessels, which means you're not trapping as much deuterium, which means you're, you're producing fluid water that's heavier, that has more deuterium content, which is gonna also disrupt the ability of the mitochondria to maintain healthy, uh, healthy state. <laughs> so it's really two, there's two aspects to how glyphosate messes things up, in my opinion, at least two. And one is this uh, disruption of the production of hydrogel, which, you know, the high hyaluronic acid sort of compensates for that. When you make all that high hyaluronic acid, it also cr creates the gel and traps the de de deuterium without using sulfate. So that's really, hyaluronic acid doesn't have any sulfate in it. 
but it has other um, molecules that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, the body's doing a workaround to, uh, against the issues that glyphosate has brought on it through the mechanism of drowning the lungs in this hydrogel in order to produce the fluid water that is low in deuterium to supply it to the mitochondria to fix the macrophages. This is a story that I'm building that I think is quite exciting because I think it may be true not just in viruses, but also in cancer, also in rheumatoid arthritis, any place you have edema, any place you have swelling, and even in the brain when you have brain swelling. I think all of those things are connected to trying to make deuterium depleted water. This is a, a huge, <laughs> a big idea. But this, when, this, this story that you're building, is it, uh, are you finding some research done by people somewhere, some, sometime? that leads to this conclusion or you're involved with uh, people who are actually conducting experiments on it right now, uh, fresh experiments to prove it or, or just by chemical theory or biochemical theory? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of papers that talk about various aspects of what's going on without looking at deuterium at all. Most of them are completely unaware of deuterium. People uh -huh. are not studying it. There's uh -huh. really only a very small community and they're mostly in, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, Ukraine, where they're serious about studying deuterium. Here, we're pretty clueless. The, the researchers here pretty much. I mean, as a school, equipment. as a school kid in India, I knew that deuterium oxide, the heavy water, absorbed radiation better than light water, which is why the the reactors used heavy water so that the radiation would be captured. Water will get hot, make steam, and that steam could be used for making power instead of uh, letting it all uh, leak out through the chamber. So I, 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 even as a kid, I knew that heavy water had a greater that's, ability to absorb. And actually, that's very interesting because it may actually, and you're, that's the first time that I heard, I knew that it was used in, the, in that industry, but I didn't quite figure out what, why. That sounds really interesting to me because it might mean that radiation, you know, we're talking about um, EMFs and all this issue about 5G and all that kind of stuff. It's possible that if people have a lot of gelled water, um, they're less sensitive to radiation exposure because the gel might be able to trap the radiation and keep them from getting damaged by it. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's I don't know whether it's good or not. <laughs> is it better to let it pass through you without affecting or is it better, <laughs> or is better uh, to absorb it and then start having problems inside? Yeah, and I, I don't know the answer. That's total speculation know. on my part. Yeah. But the other thing is just the deuterium is sort of, a, this guy, Laszlo Boros, is the person who introduced me to deuterium. And he's from Hungary. He was educated there. And he's, he's here now. He's a professor at UCLA. Really interesting guy. And he's, he's quite passionate about the idea that deuterium is a huge problem with mitochondria. And he's been trying to get people to notice that. I think he's absolutely right. And once I learned that from him, then I started reading everything I could about deuterium and how it affects the body. And then I've been building this theory, which is really you know, only a theory. I like to sort of speculate and try to figure things out. I'm always trying to ask why whenever I see something going on in the body. I don't accept it that it's just something bad is happening. It's always the body's trying to do something positive to fix a situation that's very tricky. Mm. And um, so I'm always trying to understand how what is happening would make sense in the context of what I'm seeing as a dysfunction. And I think with glyphosate, the dysfunction that I see specifically is, is messing up proteins that bind phosphate, but that turns out to be a huge, huge class of proteins, many different kinds of proteins bind phosphate at highly conserved glycine residues. And every one of them is susceptible to glyphosate damage, I think. And it won't work. And then that's going to have consequences that are diffuse. And that's why glyphosate can cause all these diseases, because it's really complicated. When it starts, when you start thinking about all these proteins being affected, it's a, a very difficult thing to figure out unless you, unless you realize that that's what's going on. It's messing up those proteins. Mm. I, as I understand, our immune system is so complicated uh, that even the best of the scientists, they only, uh, our knowledge about the immune system, the mitochondria, not mitochondria, uh, our microbiome, I think 50 years ago, nobody had an idea. 50 years ago, didn't know that continents were drifting. They thought everything was stationary in one place. So <laughs> our knowledge is really poor when it comes to uh, understanding how things work, especially at, the, at a microscopic level. We don't understand that we are a, a byproduct of all that. It, it, they are not enemies. They are the one that made us possible, uh, all these little, little creatures. Oh, I know. I think 
that they're in some sense i think we're just a nest for them like we're just a home to help yeah, them correct uh, we are in symbiosis yeah. so I, I when i see some advertisements in india there's this covid 19 has gotten into the psyche of the people so so deeply that you can't even buy a toothbrush now because they say this toothbrush has got this nanoparticles which keeps germs and bacteria and viruses oh, no. everything away and oh, all the God. others you are inviting the bacteria to come and, and this paint on the wall they have got this this, this special stuff that protects you from bacteria and viruses the bloody paint on the wall you know and it's crazy it's and it's actually so misguided i think it's a terrible idea to get and the whole generation is being uh, misguided about the very meaning of bacteria and, and, and viruses and microorganisms i know and even all this you know using clorox all the time to, to wipe the tables and all that kind of stuff i think it's really stupid yeah and then this chemical that that dangerous and then somebody yeah. selling water purifier it is so pure it's so pure it's so pure that no virus and nothing Basically, that water is useless. It has got no minerals, yeah, nothing in it. You know? Right. Well, they ruin the milk, you know, because when they pasteurize it, they take out all the good stuff. Yeah. The, 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 the microbes in the milk, and the milk has all kinds of. I think we should do it more often. It's very nice. Uh, although you talk fast, and sometimes uh, <laughs> I average person I cannot. I always try to cover a lot, and I'm I'm, I'm sort of high energy. No, no, like that's if okay. I talk that's too your slow, style. I, I lose track of my of my message. I have to yeah, keep that's up. That's your style. But the thing is, some of the terms that he used. Uh, biochemical terms uh, uh, average person uh, may not be familiar and they want to know and i can't sometimes guess properly so i don't want yeah. to write it down if so you that's if why you send me i can um, you know correct i can take a look at a first draft either that or okay. you send me the links of the papers oh yeah i'll do that too yeah and uh, then i will link them up with this video That'll and then good. i will say if somebody has any specific question yeah come back and we will ask and and we should do it more often we should this is really fun it's great how yeah. long are you going to be in uh, by the way when you fly to hawaii or anywhere else are they putting you in quarantine or something no well yeah we we actually did go in quarantine to two, for two weeks when we came there last april from where to where uh, from boston to hawaii yeah we had to be quarantined for two weeks we stayed in even if it is in the same country Yes, and now, and it's still true now, but luckily, just October 15th, which very recently, uh, Hawaii allowed you to get uh, get a COVID test, and if you pass the test, then you uh, don't have to be locked down for two weeks, which is kind of silly, because that well, but you're on the airplane, and the airplane is supposed to be a place to pick it up, yeah, right? So I, I you're know, not know, really I safe. I mean, they just go yeah. crazy with these things. But in so Canada, I'm, it's more even more crazy. I think it changes from province to province, but in, in Vancouver, somebody that came from Europe and and he was put on quarantine for two weeks and he says why two weeks quarantine test me and if there's nothing then no they won't test him and they insist that he stays yeah. in jail for two i don't know the whole thing is going crazy you know it is it's really totally out of control and and i, I think mean, if we, you just, are we that, need to just accept if it. you We've don't trust to... your own testing then why are you testing well you know everybody dies right we all have to die of, of something course. And, everybody and dies if you're healthy you should feel very confident it's not going to kill you and, and and psychologically what it is doing to older generation at least in canada those who are in old age homes and they are sick and some of them are terminally terminally ill and might be you know might not survive the winter and they are not allowing the children to visit them because i of know COVID. that's so tragic i mean this that's is really this, tragic. Uh, this is horrible this is this is the yeah. worst kind the of last torture. few days of their of their life and they can't even see their grandchildren it's really yeah sad. they won't let yeah. them and i don't know the whole thing is going crazy it's crazy i agree with you i think we we need to just accept that this virus is here to stay and we just need to get used to it and move on just go on with our lives you know i think viruses and microorganisms has been there much before we came and they they will be there much after we are gone i agree <laughs> we're killing <laughs> off all the rest of the life so we may have only viruses left by the time we're done right <laughs> correct <Correct. laughs> all right so we'll uh, call it off any last words to the listeners uh eat organic just you know you can see you can help yourself out against covid-19 how to eat, fight eat this uh, this avalanche of glyphosate nobody wants to listen government doesn't want to listen they are all beholden to the corporations so uh, i mean it's not really just usa I really appreciate what you did to get Canada to test and I talk a lot about that in my talks about how you got them to test over 8000 different food samples and they found glyphosate in all kinds of foods from the United States Correct. And, and they made a two page report out of all that basically saying we are all good and you know what they did the major cheating 
they did not separate Canadian food from anything else. So since the uh, Asian mm. food and European food were cleaner, they mixed it all up and say, oh, our carrots are pretty good. Our wheat, is, <laughs> it is our means not Canadian. The whole world's wheat because the average is low, you know. I see. So, That's really crazy. It's so dishonest. They didn't say that we are one of the but most. At least they tested. The United States is like, this stuff is fine. We know it's all over the food, but we don't care. It's perfectly yeah, safe. Yeah, so yeah. who cares? We can poison the children all we want. It's not a problem, even though our autism rates are going up exponentially. Not a problem, you know? Yeah. Autism rates are going up here, too. People don't oh, talk know. about it. It's, it's everywhere. North America is, is so badly affected. And Anyway, it's nice talking to you then. And On a, uh, on a happy note. <laughs> on a happy note. And please send us the link of your... Uh, yes, I will. I'll send the, you um, the links to all the paper, all the articles I've written on the web. There's a handful of them. And uh, also your new book. Okay. I read the draft copy. So whenever it comes out, yes, we'd like to publish it. Moving along. Yeah, the glyphosate effect. So that should come out, I hope, next year. Or hopefully early next year for good. So Very good. Thank Great. you so much, good, Stephanie. Good to we'll see stay you. in touch once Bye. again. Bye.